Hey, welcome back to part two of the Jackrabbits uh, abduction case with Susan Alloway. And today, actually, Michael, we have five guests on we at have a once. Full house. A full house. Like, uh, the this is. The uh, house has ever been, I think. I, we have never done this on the <laughs> podcast so far. But uh, this is such a huge case. There was many people involved in this, and it's going to be huge. Uh, even uh, Earl, actually, I'll introduce everybody, but Earl and I were. Uh, talking about this and he mentioned he goes oh i think it'll, it'll rival you know the travis walton case i'm like oh hands down for sure once this gets out there uh you know and the way that susan the first time she told me um of course the same thing that happened to you guys the hair stood up on my arms and i'm like mm. man this is they would make a movie out of this like it's that good right uh and, and absolutely love i uh, absolutely love that she stepped forward and and is able to tell yeah. us today about all of this stuns me about these cases is that like you say, this this is going to take MUFON's case of the year, but it stuns me that uh, what's so dis distinct about the case is probably not what happened in it so much as the fact that it just happened to be well-researched. And there's probably lots of cases out there that are very similar that could be just as, like, mind-bending, but they just didn't happen to get the the attention of, of a really good researcher in this case. And, 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 and in our case today, we have... Uh, the researchers who actually paid that attention to it and are responsible for bringing it to the to the public. So I'm really excited to to peer into that that world. It's a it's a very strange world. It is, and uh, obviously I used to work with with Mufon. I haven't done any cases with them in a long time. The podcast took up most of my. I didn't see that one coming. Uh, I thought I could do both at once, and I can't. But um, you know, the Mufon, I, I have an absolute admiration for that organization because even though there was you know some issues in the past with some, some members of the party, there's so many people that are doing so much good out there. They're helping many people deal with what they've experienced or at least you know tell them what they've experienced if it's solvable it's such a great organization and it's not like just anybody could just be a field investigator there is a process you do have to do a test or as an exam they want to make sure you know what you're doing and sure, yeah. uh, but they, they they learn uh as they go what's more awesome is when you got guys like uh richard here on our panel that is a police officer for over 30, 35 years that then joins MUFON because that gives it a really good boost. Now you got a guy that knows how to investigate and will look into things differently than let's say I would not being trained. So sure. this is amazing. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll introduce the panel. If you guys are just listening to podcasts, you're not viewing it on Spotify or YouTube. Today we have Susan Alloway, of course, which was our previous guest on the previous episode. We have Earl Gray joining us today as well. Uh, Earl, you run the uh, the state for MUFON in, is it California? Uh, I'm the state director for Southern California in MUFON. Man, that is such a badass title, isn't it? Like, I'm also a member, uh, I'm an executive member of MUFON's Experiencer Resource Team. So... And this this case straddled that uh, you know both areas, so yeah. it was kind of perfect. Th this case must have stood out to you when you received it on your desk for sure. I, I could <laughs> see I could see the smile on your face as you're probably reading the report for the first time. Uh, yeah, I I would too. I would be like, holy crap, that's a major case. Uh, also joining us today, we have Mister Preston Dennett. He's the author of thirty two <laughs> flipping books now. 32 books incredible, incredible the guy's a machine like, just a machine. on hubbard territory yeah yeah <laughs> but a better writer i've never really Not read much anything of the quality but just the output right you probably just, don't chew as many amphetamines as l ron hubbard did to, <laughs> to write <laughs> yeah isaac asimov that's a better uh but oh, asimov yeah. asimov ter did, territory i don't know i didn't take that yeah. did asimov do that i wasn't sure he did that I, I don't well, know if Stephen King was able books. to drink and, and write books. the amounts that he did too. Like there's certain books he doesn't even remember writing. That's crazy <laughs> that people could do that. But Preston, uh, you've been an investigator for, for a long time. We've had you on previously on the podcast. Uh, this is another case that uh, for you, uh, Susan had reached out to you. So we're going to get your take on that, but we want to welcome you to the podcast as well, sir. How are you doing? Very well. Thanks for having me on. This is an important case and, I'm really glad to see Susan working so hard uh, to get the word out about it because, yeah, I mean, it's an extraordinary event that she experienced and people need to know about it because, like one of you said earlier, there's a lot of people out there who've had experiences like this who aren't talking and can certainly use 
some information about you know Susan's case because it happens to a lot of people. Yeah, and the fact that it's not mainstream media, there's no point of relevance where unless you're going to watch shows that are often designed to scare. You know, whenever they talk about alien abductions, I always show the scary music and the the character. I I know it's a freaky uh, event. I know it's it's jarring and it's out of sorts for us when it happens. But it's not necessarily the way that these uh, documentary films make them out to be or shows make them out to be. So it's important to have, you know, the truth of what happened and not the Hollywoodized version that, you know, eventually comes down. Think fire in the sky. Look what they did with Travis yeah. Walton's story. Turned out to be a, a, a horror story. I was terrified of aliens after watching that as a kid. <laughs> So, yeah, I'm just glad that, you know, we got these people stepping forward. And you're right. There's so many people out there. And you, sir, have been helping a lot of them uh, in your career. So, uh, you know, kudos to you. And it's nice to see because it's people with genuine hearts like yourself that are helping people out. You guys wouldn't be here on the podcast if you guys weren't kind to help people out, right? That's what you do. So thank you. Debs, thank you so much for joining us again. How's it going? Wonderful. Uh I'm so busy, I can't keep up, let's just say. Well, that's great you know, to We were hear. talking about earlier about how things are gaining momentum with, with experiencers coming forward and everything, and that's what I spend my whole day, night, and weekends on. So, And you've had a lot more people step forward and reach out to you lately? Uh, yeah, really in the last five years or so, uh, but the last three years, it's just been, it, well, I can't keep up. Let's just say. And, and Zeb, you're a hypnotherapist or mm -hmm. a hypnotist? Of uh, yeah, I'm I'm uh, a certified and licensed. Uh, I do quantum hypnotherapy, which is kind of my own kind of my own take on it because I put a lot of I, I, I give the client homework to do and practices to do to help get them into a state before we even get together. Uh, it, it's just it, it helps them to relax so that they can open up and, and retrieve information much better so yeah sure. i've been doing that like most that. of my adult life Wonderful. so it's more of a process not just sit down or lay down oh, and yeah. i'll hypnotize you you have a process to it there has to be i feel like there has to be a personal investment from the person wanting to be hypnotized to have a really great experience to have to get the most out of it you know, like anybody can hypnotize anybody. You hypnotize yourselves many times a day without even knowing it. But to get down to the, the real quality essence of everything where you can really see everything clearly and pull it out and integrate it and use it, that's that's a whole other ball of wax. So that's what I do. Yeah. And uh, recently we lost uh, filmmaker uh, John Yost, our, our, our friend. We had him on uh, when his movie came out, which was mm -hmm. an amazing, amazing story. And he reached out to Debs, and it was Debs that helped him through um, to uncover what was hidden there. What he, there was a problem yeah. there, and yeah. um, she helped him out. And a great documentary uh, film again. You'll have to help me, Debs, with the name of the film again. It, it's called Alien Abduction Answers. Alien Abduction Answers, and every every experiencer in the film are my clients, except for Whitley Strieber, who is our expert. But. It's amazing the work that you do with these people. And, you know, even uh, very similar to Susan's case was the um, the projection of the oh, entity yes. for John. When John was a kid, he had gone to the bathroom, uh, just for those who don't know. And when he opened up the bathroom door, there was Ultraman looking at him because he was a big fan of Ultraman. Yeah. It was a projection. and a under screen hypnosis. image. Yeah. 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 Screen image. And that's crazy that they could do that either. I, I don't know how they do if it's awake or if they do it after the fact, but the fact that we can't discern if it happens at the time, like Susan, in your case, uh, 30 jackrabbits turn into 30 grays. Hmm. That's an amazing thing. Like you're, it's the way you would have mistaken that from the start, right? Like, oh yeah, they weren't jackrabbits. <laughs> like that's crazy. Uh, <laughs> and, and there's always a reveal. Then you realize, oh, it wasn't. Ultraman. It wasn't right. Jackrabbits. It wasn't my uncle. It wasn't, you know, um, I even uh, talked to somebody who said that it was like, yeah, I was uh, seven and there was a house and a nurse came out, said the doctor needed to see you and brought me inside the house. Like, okay, mm -hmm. well, what, 
What does that mean? Right? Yeah. Like, why does that stuff happen? And we we can't make heads or tails of it because it's all blurry. But this is part of, of the hypnotherapy is to be able to unblock what's being blocked and to show you mm -hmm. the pieces of the puzzle that's driving you crazy. Yeah. And I think anybody who's been living with this as long as even you have, Susan, uh, this would drive you nuts. You would want to know the little details, no matter how frightening they are. Just yeah. want to know now because it's bugging me, and you know, uh, yeah. and that, that's great that you're able to help people with that, Debs. Like, seriously, thank and you. Thank you for being here today. Oh, it's Richard. my great privilege and honor. Thank you. Absolutely. And Richard Banasiak, right? Is that, did I pronounce your last name correctly? It's actually Banasiak. Banasiak. Well, there you go. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm notorious, uh, Richard, for butchering names. That's just what I do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I put people on, like, you know, or talk to people all the time that I see them out of place. If I see them at like a superstore or something and it's like, Hey, how's it going? I'm like, I freeze. I don't know where I know them from. I know I know them, but what's their name? It's early dementia. I'm sure. Uh, Richard, you've been a, an investigator or police officer for, was it th over 35 years, sir? I actually entered in uh, doing investigations for the department of corrections in Florida in 1985. Wow. Wow. And a bit of a lifetime of work. That's doing that, an impressive career. Yeah. You know what? I'm, I feel like all of us to a certain extent are probably investigators, you know, whether it's our books or whether it's our regression or whether it's just learning about this whole subject. And in order for us to really find out about it, we have to have not only the experience or the investigator, but the regressionist. And I think all of us uh, to Preston, to Earl, to uh, Debs and, and of course, Susan, we're all part of that whole process of trying to really just understand. And as that's what I, my forte is as an investigator is to try to understand things from multiple perspectives to try to at least get some sort of picture, whatever that may be. That's sort mm -hmm. of an anomalous, you know, difficult thing to grab a hold of, especially in this particular case. So hopefully what I did and what Earl asked me to do was to look at it and, and as a good leader and as and, and somebody who knows who to assign things to, um, my job was to, just to look into it and allow the experiencer to experience and how she and us and I got together and how we were able to at least evolve the story, which is an ever evolving story even today. Oh, and so that's my that's all the things that I've tried to put into it as a MUFON investigator. But so thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. This is fun for me. Oh, absolutely. And y your work on this case is amazing. Um, I believe, uh, Earl, you said rumors that this is winning the the case of the year for for MUFON. Uh, and you guys are celebrating this, right? What's but that? we can say it. We I don't know if that's been, it's, you know, Talk like the surprise at the symposium, but I listen, happen to know, though. No, we can move talk on. about it. Yeah, listen, move on. If you're listening, <laughs> We're going to talk about it. Make this. It's a very rumored. proud It is of rumored that. that this will, that this could win the MUFON of the yes, MUFON yes. Year Award. A well-founded rumor. <laughs> well -founded, I like that. That's a good From category. From Director of Investigations at MUFON, no less, uh, Bob Spearing. But uh, yeah, when when this case came in, uh, you know, Dr. George Medich, who is our fearless leader at MUFON's Experience Resource Team, uh, you know, it was a, a it came in to Southern California. We were the closest state where they had an ERT member there, uh, as well as somebody that could uh, do the you know assess the UFO itself. Uh, a lot of experiencer cases will come in where the, you know, the experiencer is taken through the ceiling or through the window or, you know, it could be through a high-rise apartment building like uh, Linda uh, Cortile uh, in the, the Brooklyn Bridge case. Uh, you don't always see a craft, but in Susan's case, there was a craft scene as well as uh, entities that used uh, this form of, uh, you know, screen imagery to i think kind of allay their fears initially uh you know rabbits i mean that's a docile creature yeah. and, and even if there's 30 of them there's and they're three and a half foot tall it's sort of like michael cleland's owl uh oh, yes. you know yeah. thing that he talks about very similar 
Um, when the case came in, uh, I immediately recognized it as a very important case. It had all the bells and whistles. There were many markers that we look for that the public isn't even aware of uh, that we've come what to recognize. What are some of those markers that you look for? Some of them I don't want to tell because, you know, we well, still what are the use ones those. those. But what are those? For me, you know, it was that the Oz effect was in it w was occurring when they stopped the car. Uh, there, they were still under their own control, but it was varying. It, it was slowly getting out of their own uh, control. What did you call uh, that? The what effect? The Oz effect. Oz? Uh, Jenny Randall, the the British ufologist, originally came up with that term to explain how it's almost like set and setting our, our visitors mm -hmm. when they they come and they take someone or they appear to someone or they do their thing uh oftentimes sounds will become very quiet it becomes very th th strangeness happens um you won't hear external sounds almost like you're in a quiet room um and it's uh it's it's very dramatic they kind of set the stage um, and, and this was the case with with uh, with Susan's uh, case when it came in. I saw that. I recognized it. Um, you know, Dr. Medich, you know, he's going, well, jackrabbits, what the? You know, I was going, no, no, that's, you know, that is kind of, I mean, I have uh, one friend who as a child, uh, E.T. appeared as Bugs Bunny because that was his favorite cartoon character. Teddy bears. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. uh when looking at the case, I was trying to figure out who to give it to, and it didn't take me long because Richard, I knew his, his background in the police detective work that he did. Uh, he's a fine investigator with the, the nuts and bolts stuff, but he's also uh, a member of uh, the ERT. Uh, he, he understands that the experience or phenomena is a real and active thing. So it was kind of a no-brainer to give that to Richard. And I asked him, I said, I want you to act as a police detective on this, but also have the open-mindedness and the non-judgmental, uh, you know, countenance to yourself that we do with our experiencers. This is, uh, it, it kind of straddles the, the divide here as far as cases go. Um, and, and Richard did a beautiful job on it. He, he deserves all the accolades he's getting. He's mm -hmm. getting Beautiful so, job. Yeah, absolutely beautiful job on it. And and we're we're gonna just finish Susan's story because we want to get to the physical evidence that happened after the fact because we didn't get that in the last part. So Susan, we're gonna get you to fill that in. But just quickly, Richard, um, you know, being a police investigator, uh, I think your image might have frozen there. Oh, here he's back. Uh <laughs> yeah. Um Basically, being an investigator for 35 years, uh, you start, you, you know how to read people. You could tell if somebody's lying to you, being genuine. Everybody here I could tell is somebody that feels other people's emotions. You read their behaviors. You know what they're feeling. Uh, that seems to be a trait in the community that at least if the, the empathy is what allows us to hear other people's cases and visualize what they say. I think if you're a psychopath or sociopath, it's it's out of your depth to be able to understand this. And um, but you know, Richard, it, 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 the fact that you've been doing this for so long, have you found a, a particular set or not? I won't say particular set. Let me rephrase that. Have you found that you're able to tell if somebody's telling you the truth on their experience pretty much within the first hour of talking to them, or does it take a while? You know, it really depends. I mean, I don't think any of us are are as good reading everybody, but I mean, you do learn. Um, so, you know, from, you know, what you do with the particular thing that you're investigating, you sort of do have, I think, as Earl had mentioned, we call them indicators or markers or consistencies, whether it's what Preston's doing or Deb is looking for, Earl's looking for, I just, I'm reading Dr. Mack's book um, on abduction and, um, you know, his passport to the cosmos. And, you know, this group of investigation is a very different group because a mm -hmm. lot of it happens into the area that you mentioned, Jason, early. And that's this whole idea of screen images and psyche and your own perception of reality. And as Earl looked, talks about it, he talks about we look at these things that 
have this whole idea of high strangeness. And I think that's Preston's book. That was his whole book is that humanoid and high strangeness aspect of it. And that's what Susan's did. And then when Susan went down her story, we spent a long time, by the way, our first interview, and Susan will tell you, and it's because of the type that I am, we spent probably <laughs> five hours on the phone. Wow. The very first time when we had our interview, we had an introduction, you sent some emails. But the point is, is that's how you determine, Jason, is there some consistency? Then you go back over, you know, there's all kinds of things. But this this subject is a very, very difficult and anomalous. It's sorry to use the pun and the word, but it, and not only that, a very deep um spiritual psychological paranormal whatever you want to call it i don't think anybody really can even grasp it and to understand what it means to not only the experiencer but all of us because we're also experiencing what she's experiencing as it reflects in our own lives and you know these things happen all all over the place so when i did talk to her and i did uh have her go over a number of things uh, she was actually not only Earl, but Preston gave her a lot of indications of what to look for about reporting it. You know, it, that's a lot of kudos to Preston. Preston has a MUFON background, too, if I can say that, Preston. I, I, I'm not saying I know you very well. But the point is, is, is it's to get it out there. And, and then when we started talking, and then she created these drawings. And she created some additional information. And we dug in deep, and we went deeper and deep. And as you go deep, and I, and I think... Uh, Debs will mention this and maybe some of the things that she's talked about, these dreams and these layers of memory that are not only flashes, they start to resonate more and more. And then she started saying, Susan started saying things about certain aspects of it that were consistent with a lot. Earl talks about this with a lot about what MUFON and people who study this field are indicators or indicative of people who've experienced strangeness to whatever extent, beer contact, seeing something, or something a lot more deeper than that. And so it it, it like everything else, that's what evolved out of of, of what uh Susan was speaking of. And I'm again I, I'm not speaking for Susan, I'm only speaking for what I got out of it. So hopefully that helps. Yeah. I think it's re really interesting. You you talk about all the like psychological layers and, and and sort of peeling away the onion to get to to the a person's original experience mm -hmm. or not. And just it might be helpful for listeners. Uh, we, we we keep referencing this concept of a screen memory, um, and that's actually a concept that comes from Freudian psychoanalysis, where you'll have an experience that's so uh, intellectually difficult to process or emotionally difficult to process that your brain sort of puts a, a, a reinterpretation of it over that memory that makes it more and a protection sense. palatable to you. Yeah, it's yeah. a protection. Carl Jung. Yeah, talk I was about, say, that's about young. Freudian Carl Jung. I mean, he was actually the yeah. man who <clears throat> even got it even closer, just from my perspective. For, mm -hmm. But the point is, is we create these zones and these areas to help us deal with the trauma. And not only that, just think about it. And this is what our, I would like to think all of us who are in this field there is no box. Right. Right. The Bagrian's right. idea about squaring the circle. We don't try to square the circle anymore. No. And what my point is, is when you square the circle in the Pythagorean theorem or whatever, he's trying to make it what we can understand. you got to get rid of the box. And the only way that you're really going to understand ourselves, including what Susan's going through, it's another example. But it's not only Susan, it's all of us. you got to get away from the box. Absolutely. And you got to open your mind because I think, Jason, what you said is the media and the, whoever's <laughs> dictating you know, the reality or whatever. They got boxes. They got things that they're doing. But this is not about a box. This is so much bigger than that. And at least that's been mine, Michael, my idea of how I've approached it. So for Yeah, it's right. like constantly trying to identify what your box is and, and move outside of that and then find at least whatever the next box you're thinking. You often don't you realize of, what, yeah. you're, what box you're thinking within until yeah. you hit a wall. And then you're like, oh, I, this, this is a presupposition or an assumption that I've been using that I didn't even realize was there. And now I need to question it and go outside of it. So, right. yeah, we're always kind of trying to explode the box. And have and the courage to way. do that. Yeah. yeah. Have the courage to do that. That's well, a scary UFO thing. Experience, a UFO experience, typically, when it's as extensive as Susan's, it challenges you mentally, physically emotionally spiritually psychically on multiple yes. levels in susan's case really typifies that 
And yeah, the absolutely. family dynamics as all well. the aspects of that. Yeah. Right. Like, like the family add, situation, okay. the home situation, like that's that's yeah. also a huge uh, a huge effect for people. It, it 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 has proven lives in the past and will continue to do so going forward for sure. Sorry, Debs, yeah. go ahead. No, I, I just wanted to add to what Preston was saying because it's so brilliant and it's what I see every day in this work. These different layers keep coming and coming. We keep uncovering, uncovering, and it, it's almost give it, it's almost coming out of them in the perfect timing so that they can handle it and understand it. But what we find is when you do start to get all of these variables put in together, they come up with such a mind blowing experience. And I call it the timing mechanism. Everybody has one. Everybody has a timing mechanism on these things. You think you know what you saw or you have a feeling that something happened, but you're not sure. So you begin to dig and dig and dig. You come up with all of this data this information and then it suddenly it starts to come together and that is it's kind of a shock and awe alarm clock that goes off in your psyche and then you get the message of what you're supposed to do in this in this world in this life everyone i've worked with all these thousands of people every single one of them this is the purpose for these experiences but they don't reveal themselves or reveal themselves fully until the timing is perfect for them to get the message that it's time to get to work yeah and do something susan's doing Incredible something completely different right now than she was two years ago <laughs> completely <laughs> right you know, and jason yeah. this makes me think of our interview with matthew roberts um who was on the uss theodore roosevelt during all the um you know the, the encounters that they had with the Tic Tac and the Go Fast and things and how his journey becomes one from the sort of kind of a classic UFO experience to a religious sort of viewpoint where he says, no, now I understand that my life isn't my own and that I'm here mm -hmm. to, to live in this sort of expansive mode of consciousness that helps other people find their own way of being in the world. So that's a, I think that's just such a fascinating trajectory that it moves from like, oh, the, you know, there are aliens that have fancy Teslas that move around in the sky to like, no, it's not really about that. It's about this completely different, uh, deeper thing. Yeah. Their, no. their batteries don't run out. That's the difference between their yeah, technology and Tesla. That's the only, if that's the only difference, it's not even that interesting to me. It's like, okay, yeah, somebody has a better Why battery. they cool, using but, yeah. But yeah, you know, so, what, yeah, you get to Susan's story, though. Yeah, right? absolutely, and and it, this is the part, Susan, where we want to delve back into because last time, uh, when we left the last episode, we were pretty much at that. You know, when you woke up at the diner, you ended up in the hotel. Uh, you know, then you noticed the car still has the same amount of mileage, is still the same amount of gas. That <laughs> I don't know how you ended up that far, <laughs> nine hours ahead, and not a single kilometer put on that car. Or miles so you guys use in the states, uh, and and that blows my mind. But let, let's take it from there because there there's more to this story here. So, uh, could you take us back to you know maybe like a day or two after the hotel event with you and Karen? Okay, so um, we we knew things had gone on Karen and I, but we didn't talk about them because we couldn't talk about them. So all the conversation was. <laughs> singing whatever was on the radio. Thank goodness that we had music because it would have been startling quiet <laughs> because of what was going on in our head um, over the last 24 to 48 hours. And we were going to stop and see a, a, a lot of people and visit. And uh, we did. Um, but I remember it wasn't fun and exciting because I was pretty sick and, uh, burned. I still had radiation burns and the blisters were still coming up. And then I had that big hickey thing on my neck. That was a big scoop. So I tried to always cover that up. I was very worried if anybody would ask and I would have to come up with a, a lie because I had already started lying to myself about what had really happened, even though you couldn't really make up anything. <laughs> Yeah, to cover out of desperation. Right? Yeah. 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 Because the lies start. That's that's the whole thing that got me about John Yost's movie is, is it, that first 17 seconds when he talks about the lies, living with the lies that you just cover up that story. It started immediately. I was very aware of that. By the time I got home, 
um, I, I was feeling better, but I think I was just adjusting to getting used to it and knew I had to tuck it away. And then we got carried back to the airport. Um, and then I got sick and I, 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 I can't even tell you, I got deathly ill. Uh, nothing would stay in me. I was, you know, both ends. I was sick. Daddy wrapped me in a towel. He was taking me back and forth to the toilet. My stepmother had a, a, a can. Uh, I was vomiting in. It got so bad. A really high fever, profuse sweating. I was having uh, what felt like delusions, delusional, uh, weird thoughts. I felt like I was in a dream state and daddy went down the road because we live in a little town and because he had been a police officer, he went and talked to the pharmacist and he brought home some phenobarbital. Well, this was in 1978. So you could do those things and um, gave me two of them. I remember because I had no idea what they were going to do. I didn't really care. I just needed to be, I just needed the sickness to stop. I was trying to, I was holding my dad's face and trying to tell him, jackrabbits in the road next thing you know we wake up sick in a diner and i i could see his face he was uh, i think it was um confusion and disappointment and I, I i could see all of it and that was the part that was so upsetting and so i went to sleep for uh, probably about 30 to 40 hours it was about two days when i woke up they were sitting beside me and i felt much better and everything got progressively better. The pain was gone. I wasn't as sick. I stayed for about two weeks and then I flew back to, um, to Imperial beach to San Diego and Karen was there. And thank goodness I had a boyfriend that I had started dating before and he was going to be my husband for 35 years. And she had one of my best friends, Rick, that she had started dating. So that gave us a cushion that even though we were living together, we we didn't have to talk about what had happened on the trip. We would reference the trip, but only to a certain point in our eyes. I, I remember it was very hard for us to even look at each other because with that look, you got the understanding of the fact that we can't talk to each other about what had happened. So um, I got married and she got married and moved away. We didn't see each other for many years and raised my family. We raised a family. Um, we moved like 27 times during our marriage and um, everywhere we went, of course, I, even with the kids, I was pretty quiet about it. I didn't talk about it much. Occasionally it would come up or one with somebody would hear a subject or we would watch something in on TV and, they didn't ask a lot of questions, even though they knew I had had an experience, but that was kind of mom's world or Susan's world, or it was always just cast off as something else and laughed off. And then we, we went past it. But um, what happened that came back, it came back all into my life. Cause in the meantime, I had all these kind of what I call superpowers. I, I, I knew things were going to happen before they happened and I could feel the feelings in the room of everybody. And I also had this odd thing that sometimes I would go up to the top of the room and look down and see what was going on below me. And I could, get a different perspective, but it's very strange when you don't control that, but you get those things. So you just kind of poo poo them off yourself. Is and, like an out of body sort of thing. You yeah. could go to the top of the room and yeah, it was so weird. It was, let's say somebody at the table and we always had dinner at the table, five thirty or six o'clock, even if we had ball games or whatever, the table was almost mandatory. That was when we all talked, everything came out. Um, I would instantly know when the kids were lying or uh, if they had alternative plans <laughs> from what they were telling me or, and sometimes, you know, I called them on it. And a lot of times I didn't because, you know, you just have to know what, when to pick your battles. And um, sometimes I would hear somebody say something that was so cringeworthy. That's when I would kind of look down and I don't know 
I don't even know how to explain it. It would be like, zoop. it's like you were seeing them from up there, but you were still sitting at the table because when you look down, you could see, still see yourself sitting at the table. But the conversation would come up to where somebody would say, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. Or somebody would recommend somebody to do something else. And then I would see how it's going to affect everybody mm-hmm. outside of that house. Like it was like you could see the wave happening in your mind of how that one small judgment on their part would go and wave out to all the people around us and our people around them in their schoolroom and their group of friends. It just became so overwhelming sometimes that I couldn't, I couldn't just say something because it'd be like correcting people all the time. So you just mm-hmm. keep it to yourself and know that that's not yours. That will work out. But sometimes I would have to intervene. It's like I would just pop back down to the table or wherever I was and just say, you know, maybe if you think about it this way and I would not try to have my agenda, but I would try to point them in a better, safer direction. Because if you try to explain about that wave effect of how many people you're going to affect by making that decision, It would have been so, it, it would have just been anxiety causing and troublemaking. <laughs> I guess Deb knows what I'm talking about. Because sometimes you just know these things. And when you know them, you also learn to figure out when to speak them and when not to. So um, all so of that was going on. for so all pre- for, precognition. Yeah. It, yeah. It, and it was always, it was just, I, I learned to, First, I, I, I quit fighting it and just learned to accept it. And then I learned to really enjoy it Yeah. Um, because it, you, you just get, I've, I've never, I've never had a negative downside on my life. Well, the hardest part of my life was probably just my mother's bad attitude. She wasn't nice. But other than that, everything's always been cheery and I'm naturally happy inside. Um, and I've always just been that way. But um, in 1989, after my son was born, I got really sick again. Uh, I went to the OBGYN and I said, I, I think I need a hysterectomy because I, I don't want any more children. And um, I've just been really sick. And so I had the hysterectomy in 1989. I think it was in August of 89. It was right about, it was right before the big earthquake in San Francisco because we had moved up there right after San Francisco. You can't forget that because it was like the house shook every single day for six months. So I remember the doctor after the hysterectomy, he said, "Uh, I have questions because you told me you had never had uh, surgery before. And he told me that he, I had a missing ovary on a right ovary and that he had found and, and removed my appendix because at some time, this was so weird at some times. And he went like this with his hands at some time in my past, it's obvious that my appendix had ruptured hmm. and that it had been folded over and he went like this and then sealed with some kind of high heat cauterization laser. Those were his words. And he, and he went like this and he said, I am totally confused because we don't use this in, in this kind of procedure because this was 1989. And you told me you had not had surgery before. Well, I was pretty stunned, but I actually knew it had something to do with that missing time. There was no doubt in my mind because of all the trouble that it had had on that right side afterwards, um, which I would have probably thought that might have been the appendix. But to this day, now I feel like that during that nine hours, I'm pretty sure they took my ovary and their, the visit um, is that nine hours that was missing is when they fixed my appendix and took my ovary. Mm. There's, there's just no other 
there's just no other way to explain that, that they, that the doctor had found that in 89, but yet the thing happened, the nine hours of missing time was in 78. And, and the most recent thing is, is this copy of my VA files. And it's the, it's the C file, veteran C file. That's my medical record. It actually proves to me that I had my right ovary three months before I got out of the service because they suspected uh, a cyst on my ovary or my appendix. Oh, and wow. this I have just, I just found out two weeks ago. And I, and it's so weird because this is one of those things where it pops in. I was watching Deb Cobbles and on, and I don't even remember what it was that she said, but something popped into my mind to reach over here and grab that file and to look and to verify that I did have that right ovary and it was functioning, but troublesome. Something was going on on that right side. So that's what makes me think that when I got out of the service, the day I got out of the service and we took that trip, that that's what happened is they intervened. It's the only thing I could think of. Because did didn't... they do an ex examination on you when you were having pain there that they suspected might be due to your appendix here over? Was there an exam done? From, from the Navy? Yeah. Oh, multiple, multiple. You can see where I've gone back for three months complaining about that right side. And the questions are right there to where they didn't really pursue it. But I remember that I had gone to an outside OBGYN because I didn't trust the Navy. And he had found and felt a, a cyst on my right ovary. So I know wow. I had the right ovary. That, that's what was so weird is when the doctor in 89 said, it had just, you, you, you're missing a right ovary. So it wasn't just that you you had gone in and said, I'm having some pain in this area. And they said, well, maybe it's your appendix, maybe it's your ovary. They actually yeah. um, did a gynecological exam that, that yes. at least yeah. indicated. Yes, I had that two, that one from the Navy and one from a civilian doctor. That's what's so weird is it all shows up. And then I have to remember after all these years that it's here. So when I look there, just from something that popped into my mind from watching another show, I was so thankful. Deb doesn't even know she's done that, but I was so thankful that it was right there because I'm working with the VA right now on my disability. And I picked that up and there it was. So it's got red circles all over it. Um, every time that was mentioned. So I'm sure I had a right ovary. And then all of a sudden in 89, I don't have one. Mm -hmm. Wow. And I have the scar. So, um, I've looked, I, you know, I called the doctor. There's no way they don't have that. They don't have records back as far as 1989. But I, the nurse actually talked to the doctor. and He doesn't remember. He remembered something about uh, a weird uh, appendix, but he's got dementia. And so mm -hmm. that was kind of like the last chance. But the cool thing was he was still peppy and fun. And um, it was kind of humorous talking to him. And um <laughs> And if they do find a record, I know that they'll find, they'll call me. So that's the good thing. Um, but it's kind of coming around the fact that I know that I had that right over it. Makes a huge difference in knowing that it was there and it was verified that it was there. And then all of a sudden it's just gone. And I don't know how that happens because there are no other scars and I've never had my appendix worked on. So it's, you know, a, 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 about eight years ago, maybe. <laughs> I had my appendix removed and for maybe three weeks, I kept like, Oh yeah, I have a little bit of pain on this side. Like I wasn't yeah. like in the movies where people are on the floor. Uh, I just <laughs> thought I'd go check it out. And um, mm -hmm. it turned out it was appendicitis. So I, I ended up staying in the hospital for 12 hours. They did the emergency, but the whole time I'd, I wasn't in pain. They asked me like, do you want painkillers? And I should have said, yes, that was free drugs. That was all my bad. <laughs> I, I said, no, um, I'm good. And I waited 12 hours for the surgery. And then uh, by the time they, they took it out, they're like, yeah, it was really bad appendicitis. I'm like, why didn't I feel it? And in your uh, case, Susan, I think this is very similar. You would have had appendicitis for some time, mm -hmm. but you didn't feel it. Uh, Preston, in this case, do you think this was like an intervention from them, like a medical thing? Or do you think they just found it while they were working in there and said, all right, boys, we've got some work to do and took it out for her. Like, uh, what, what are your ideas on this? 
Well, of course, it's impossible to say for sure. We can really only speculate, but I suspect that, yes, it was an intervention because there's so many cases like this. This is really one of the main ET agendas, in my opinion, because I've documented more than 300 cases of healings, of including intended scientists, but really everything across the board. So I truly feel like this is one of the main things ETs bring people on board for. The physical exam is what most people will describe. So to hear Susan talking about this, and kudos to you, Susan, for really aggressively pursuing your medical records, because I always yeah. recommend that people do that who have this kind of experience, because it does provide like verification. Yeah, I've been on it. <laughs> I have been on it. Want to say something, Richard? Yeah, so I, I'd like to echo something Preston said. And, and so I don't know how far Susan has gone. There was a previous, a couple of previous experiences. And so we've also saw in a number of these cases that these have been an ongoing um, contact for a long time. And there actually was a previous contact just prior to um, the event that happened during that, that cross-country trip. And yeah. so this ability to monitor... Um, whoever they they or whatever the purpose or for whatever the reason is 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 a pretty consistent them knowing and being aware of it in 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 however they do that but the other thing that's really consistent is this idea of how they're they're interested in the reproductiveness uh, especially in females uh, especially how ovaries work especially how that relates to whatever the other ideas or purposes or intense that that is for so there was a consistency so not only that when susan um uh, one of the things that i remember and so this is susan and i were we talked about recently about how our interview was sort of raw and the freshness of how i got it but she talked about the doctor when he came out he found this little pouch that was sewed in on the inside yeah. and in the pouch it had a petrified or putrefied poop in it and so whatever was going on inside of her at that time, somebody had done some kind of surgery and contained or isolated something. And it part of it was still in her. So you can get that from gallstones. You can get that from your appendix. You can get that from other things that are in that reproductiveness. But these are consistent with other abduction cases yeah. and other long-term interactions with them. So that was another marker, if you will. And I just yep. wanted to add what Preston was saying. To well, this. you mentioned, Richard, you know, that that, you know, I, my background, I, I worked as a nurse for 40 years. And and uh, what you mentioned with the excrement that had dried in there, that can cause septicemia. That can be a fatal, yep. uh, a fatal uh, outcome to that. So I believe that the intercession that they did possibly could have saved her life. They could yeah. have saved her life. Also, you mentioned, you know, the, the gifts that you that were switched on through your contact experience. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, Michael, you were you were asking earlier about markers that we look for. That's one of them. You know, Kenneth Ring wrote in his book, Project Omega. I think he was the first person to have discovered that uh, when you have ET contact, uh, it's apparently contagious. We we sort of uh, start exhibiting some of the gifts that we usually uh, attribute to our visitors themselves. Exactly. So that was a big marker that, that uh, I looked for and that I always do look for. And that's not unusual. You know, many of us, uh, synchronicities, telepathic uh, enhancement, uh, the feeling, the feeling of uh, empathy with everyone else, uh, feeling others' emotions, and and, and all that. Uh, that whole, that, those are all the bells and whistles that people are left with. So, uh, when you Debs mentioned the timing aspect, I thought instantly of how Susan went online and found John Yost's movie <laughs> right after it had been released. Yeah. Exactly. It was, the same day. it was the same day. Yeah. It was the <laughs> day of release. It meant to my be. head and said, go look up UFO movie. And there it was. Just, wow. it, just that was May 3rd, I believe, in 22, mm -hmm. May 3rd. And, and I contacted John, I think, before August. I think pretty, I think it was probably before July. And then um, I could look back 
on the Facebook. It was, it was midsummer, I think. Yeah, yeah. Because you were September. I, I was mm -hmm. already with you by se September. Mm -hmm. And then called Preston in, in February is when he started working on that book, I believe. Yeah. It so went really it, fast for her. It, it was. There was no question. The second I saw it, the first 17 seconds just changed. Switch something on it. it it's just like reach out because I am not a person to reach out to a producer of a movie. That's so weird <laughs> that to reach out to John and John knew exactly what to do. And he was always so kind and loving and sent me to Debs and Debs picked me right up. And then we talked a minute and made the appointment. Um, I think that was September 3rd. And then um, Preston I, was February. Um, and then the book came out in August 1st, I believe. Isn't that right, Preston? Yeah, I, I think, think it right came now. out. August. So it's just, that just was a the little time. over a year. Y yes. And it that. just was a magical ball that mm -hmm. it was so weird how everybody on this screen just turned into my tribe. And I love you all so much. <laughs> I love you too. <laughs> the right people at the right time too. You know, yeah. I mean, Preston and Debs, you know, I mean, because it, it, just yeah. the ontological shock that people suffer. Can, that can be a speed bump yeah. in a person's life. And a lot of people never get over that. Yeah. But those two, you know, they, yeah. they understand this stuff and the, the compassion there. And, and, and it was perfect. I mean, if you'd come to MUFON first, you know, we have to be, we have to do the scientific part and, and, and we have to sort of wear a skeptic sat as well, you know, it would have been yeah. the wrong uh, order of, of, of people, but it, it was just like perfectly, you know, like, well, like, like cast, you know. It's so weird with you, because <laughs> you actually already knew the case, but I didn't know any that you were the one that had signed it to Richard. And I think it was on a spaced out radio, maybe that. Yeah. You were on there one night, and then I was in the chat, and I he said something about jackrabbits, and I said, oh, that, that's, <laughs> that's my case. My case. Said, that was you. And, and he yeah. looked at the camera, and he said, oh, you're using your real name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I, I, I kept you anonymous. I, I knew that, you know, I thought, you had wanted I supposed that. supposed to be afraid? Because it's <laughs> the first time I thought, am I supposed to be afraid? And then I thought... Mm -hmm. No. I am not going to be afraid. I am I am moving forward. Just like y'all were talking about, all outside the box. Everything, there was no box. Yeah. It was no more. Because Duck once these lives dead, matter, right? Yes, they do. Yes. yes. Uh, heck yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Susan, if, if I could, uh, <laughs> the the whole purpose of the movie once we realized we were actually making a movie at first it was just he wanted to document his session uh, more cinematically than doing it over zoom and he you know so that that was a whole separate thing john but once we realized it was a movie and it, that's when his his timing mechanism went off basically in his session and he knew what his purpose was and he knew he had to make a film out of this and get other experiencers involved and so the purpose from day one was anyone involved in that movie had to be in a specific energetic state there was no fear there was no judgment everybody had to work harmoniously we wanted to put as much energy of goodness and compassion into every phase like even into the marketing it just Everybody had to sign on for that or they couldn't work with us. And if you were having a bad day, you had to be off the team for that day until you could come back and be refreshed. What we found is I get the Susan story 10 times a month now. When it first came out, it was every single day, 10 times a day. People who had the same thing, they just they saw the movie, the energy of it came through and somehow that movie is a carrier wave for the mess, the greater message or the underlying message. We feel that these beings or these other versions of us, if, if you will, are trying to get through to us. It's the time is now. Don't be afraid. There are people who will help. Just say something. Just reach out to one person and it starts to come together. And indeed, that's what's happening it in really a snowball fashion.
Now, yeah. one of the, the the things that I love about this case is that usually when you have, you know, Travis Walton, his buddy saw him get lifted up and then tossed. They bailed out on him. Obviously, it was a rescue mission on that one as well. They couldn't leave him there. And he said when he woke up, he had some sort of instrument on his chest and the three little guys were working on him and he felt his chest was heavy, but they were rescuing him. But he was alone in that experience. In your case, Susan, you had Karen. Now, yeah. I love this because these are the one-offs. Uh, you know, it happens to be a, a kid that goes and sleeps over another kid's house. That kid's an abductee, and it just happens that night is his night again. Friends coming with, right? Sometimes they don't. I don't understand why they don't select. Like, no, not him. Just don't. I'll just leave him. <laughs> Like, I don't understand why they pick some people and others they don't. But in your case, Karen came with. And that's what's really interesting in your case, because you had weird experiences like this before. Um, yeah. Since you were a kid, I, I'm not, grooming is probably the wrong word, but you were used to them in a certain way. You were used to these oddities, the Oz effect, yeah. like Earl mentioned. She was yeah. not. So my question to you, Debs, do you have people that are reaching out to you that are the one-offs or is it mostly people that have had this happen over their lifetimes and possibly coming from their, their parents' side? Well, to be really honest, once we get in there, almost no one is a one-off. What I found, uh, okay. it, it's happening all the time. I believe it's happening to everyone, but some people aren't ready to to accept it or handle it, or it's just not, the timing mechanism hasn't happened. But, but for the most part, I, I can't even think of anyone I've worked with in all these years, all these decades, who once we went in there said, yep, that was just the only, that was just the only time it was, maybe it's just, you know, right place, right time. Because what happens is once you start to remember, other things start to come, make more sense in your life that, we're just kind of floating out there, you know, like, like I have a podcast called hidden variables. There are those little hidden variables just floating around in your life that, you know, they were experiences, but they don't mean anything or they're not connected to anything, but they're all connected. Just like we're all connected. And so, and I'm just speaking from my own personal practice. I just really can't even think of anyone that I've worked with who was just had one experience. I agree with that as a general rule. I think it does start very early in childhood. I've had a few one-off cases, but I suspect there's probably something there. That they're uh, not ready to remember. Yeah. In Susan's case, yeah, she had some very unusual experiences as an early child and was already getting the messages that the ETs mm -hmm. gave her when they took her on board on that lonely yeah. desert highway, which is really, to me, what the experience is really about, the message that they gave her, it which is. is echoed over and over yep. again in yep. experiences. It's the like same that. message. And, and what you're going to find, too, and I would like Susan to mention this because she and I talk, Karen's case is not a one-off necessarily either. So that was did not a recent, know that. Did not that know that. That was a recent re mm. revelation. Susan has found out some additional stuff, and I'm not going to mention. So, Susan, hopefully I didn't spill or say anything. But if you oh, No, 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 no. Okay, go ahead. The the funny thing is, the, the, the funny thing is our relationship has come back so strong now that we can talk to each other about this whole thing. And the weirdest thing is she calls me one day and she said, I'm raising, she has a farm now, I'm raising giant bunnies. Giant. We're talking gigantic, <laughs> long-eared rabbits. I you say it'd be the opposite. The yeah. coolest thing. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but also rabbit so also yeah. i think that she can if you don't mind susan she's also mentioned that she has opened up to her own family and mm -hmm. they have shared some other things so go ahead susan um well she's opened up a little bit to her family um has she contacted you richard not yet okay she she bought a lot of books for Christmas and she sent them Preston's book with the story of, of our story, Karen and I, because her name is in there. And she has sent them to a lot of people in her family and old friends. And she's finding out that they're very accepting. Mm -hmm. And 
Um, That's lovely. It's not all out of the box. Mm. It, it's every a lot of people are out of the box that you don't think are out of the box. I know. So a lot of people have come around, but I was so thrilled that she was sharing it and that um, she also sent me pictures from the trip. And the weirdest thing is the only pictures that we have from the trip, not the fabulous day before this happened that night, but absolutely every moment, the rest of the trip we have on camera, but nothing that first day. I just found that to be so weird. But we have a lot of the old pictures that prove exactly who we went and visited and the same thing that we already remembered. So um, Karen's not fighting at all. She's been right there for me. She's lifted me up. We've just become the best friends like we used to. But older friendships, even though all those years that we didn't talk, I, I it's not, it's not, it's like they didn't happen because we're just back to our really happy selves again that we support each other and um i'm hoping that she shows up at the mufon symposium earl me too and that get to meet her yeah i'd I'm love gonna... to work i would love to work with her if she's ever open tell oh, her oh, the invitation is there i've talked with her about mm -hmm. that with all of it and, but no um, pressure yeah i just don't give her any pressure because i know there's certain things in her life and i i think it's because of Karen's father is a major naval hero, and all of that she kind of keeps quiet. Of course. Uh, um, but he was one of my naval heroes before. When I met her, I had no idea that that was his daughter. And when I showed mm -hmm. up at their house for dinner one day, it blew my mind. I was <laughs> sitting there with my naval hero at the table. So that's, see, wow. that's another weird yeah. synchronicity right there. I didn't know that. <laughs> that yeah. is bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, and her mother is quite old, and I'm not sure that she's just willing to share that yet. But in time, I think that she will completely come out. But she's um, she's very happy that I've told it, and we laugh hilariously to this day about would we really stop? Would we, in our right minds, that we would just stop on the highway and open the doors and just get out and walk in and, the night in the <laughs> in the desert. Yes. No drugs yes. involved, you know? Yeah, after the full moon had come up and disappeared and the mm. stars had gone out. You know, it's obvious we weren't in our right minds because now we just laugh that she says, oh, hell no. We'd be like Thelma and Louise. We'd just zoom right through and <laughs> she would keep on going. But then there's that other part of the animal side that I don't think I would ever be able to run over anything. Well, no. like. That's why right. they chose rabbits. Yeah. They exactly. Do. And it's really, here's another odd thing. Um, at the very beginning, when we first all were talking, uh, the fact that there was a big circle, and I remember it, every place that we planned to stop, Grand Junction was circled on our map. We had already spoken about that's where we were going to drive to and spend the next day, and just sleep during the day when it was hot, and, you know, drive the night before. And I think about that even um, about Kevin Day talking about something called um, intent tonics, like intention, mm -hmm. like it being an energy, because I had just told her mm -hmm. about, I hope we see jackrabbits tonight, uh -huh. like we did from that last time wow. when I had seen them in the desert, when I didn't even know at that time that I had been taken. So that was, you know, another time. And I wasn't even aware of that. Until with until I had had hypnosis with Debs, mm -hmm. and that's when I and I'll never forget this. Debs, remember saying the shoe, the shoe, <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, the shoe. It just was so weird. I was I was talking to Debs and telling her what I was saying. All of a sudden, the shoe. I just saw the shoe fly off, and it reminded huh. me, even under hypnosis, about. That's what happened with my shoe because there was a weird story with the shoe in the desert. So nobody well, ever could tell you, you, you couldn't figure out where yeah. it went. Well, yeah. it, it, there's a weird, there's a bizarre thing that happens and it happened to you several times. And everyone here that's investigated it, you've heard it a thousand times, but your eyes will deceive you. Your ears yes. will deceive you. The, the air becomes like static. Like you can't trust your five senses 
It's like they yeah. interfere with it. And that's what messes with people because every yeah. day your five senses are on. That's how you gauge the world around you. Yes. But if they're able to control that, then you don't really have control over this car that we're driving, right? It's like they have control of it. They could shut it down. They come in yeah. for an oil change every once in a while, forcefully, unfortunately. Uh, but the this is why I don't believe really so much in a threat narrative that the United States government is trying to yeah. impose that yeah. it's a national it's security so threat. I'm like, they tuck people back into bed, you know, yeah. they bring you back yeah. to the spot. In your case, they're like, oh, she wants to go 360 kilometers or miles that way. Take her. Yes. Just just take her there. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. why, would they bother? why would they bother? They could have just yeah. dropped you right back off on a highway, but they exactly. don't. That's the part mm -hmm. that to me is like, and there's a sense of humor to them too. Yeah. Uh, playfulness. You know, playfulness. Yeah. Uh, the size of the operation. So in your case, you know, the, the moons disappear, stuff like that. Who knew how big that bloody craft was above you? But in Terry Lovelace's situation, it was a massive triangular craft. Like you got to think about the operations of these things must be like, if it costs money, it's big endeavors for them to come out to take somebody. Yeah. Yeah. And even when he well, said he's on this on a table screaming and the doctor, whatever it was, leaned in and he could hear him telepathically say, Oh, be quiet. You know, we always put you back. Like that's a joke. That's a joke. That is. Yeah. That's the closest great. thing to a joke I've heard. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I I was just wondering about uh, your your all of your opinions, everyone, including Michael. Like, do you think there's a threat? narrative here like what are your thoughts on this let's start with uh susan actually and work way over to earl well i i the only time i felt major fear was waking up in that diner with no explanations as to how we got there that was the scariest part being aware of and having that total conscious memory of the jackrabbits in the road and then turning around and the white light and the whole thing that really was not the scariest part it was magical amazing there's no words for it but the scary part was the knowing how manipulated you could be by waking up in that diner you felt like a speck you felt like you had no purpose um nothing was that important other than to figure out how that happened that's how but yet having to keep it quiet all at the same time so um, the the coolest part is when Preston and Richard both sent me emails and proof of other sightings from MUFON wow. uh, within 24 hours of that same night of tremendous ships because it had to be tremendous to cover the moon, the stars, the, the end for highway to highway, the mountain to mountain is how big it had to be to have covered all that. So when I found out other people had reported it, that was fascinating to me, the most fascinating part. And also when um, when Richard wrote and said he had contacted some diners, I know he must have thought I was crazy because the first thing I said is, oh, my God, what do you say when you talk to people like <laughs> how do you how do you bring that up? Because I had never reached out because. I thought that they would think I was crazy because I didn't even know where to start, how I got there. So the fact that he had spoken to people who were at two diners, which could possibly be the ones that were in the right place. And they were open in 1978 that, you know, the area is so empty out there for the fact that he found those, like all of this was so fascinating and, um, I don't know if that answered the question you just asked. Yeah, but well, just it, obviously you, you suffered, you know, radiation poisoning, radiation burns, yeah. like you, you got sick. Uh, yeah. Obviously it turned out for the better in the long run. But I mean, at first, if that happened to me, I'd be like, oh my God, these buggers are up to no good. Uh, well, you know, I was sick. What did they do to me? Right. Like that would yeah. be my initial thought. But looking back now, I mean, knowing the data, However, many years later, you're like, I think they crap. saved my life. Right. I think they saved my life. I think it was a total in intervention on their part. And it's probably because they actually knew it and I didn't know it because we had had 
previous encounters right. um, that I didn't always remember what had happened. So thank goodness for Debs that she opened all that up. <laughs> Perfect. And Earl, you do what, it what are your thoughts on, on uh, the threat narrative? I don't believe they're a threat. I think that uh, it's 77 years since Roswell and uh, – what we still hear from officialdom is, is that they're doing threat assessment and how may we weaponize this? I mean, I think that's why we got the arrow report with such lousy results. Oh, so good. For the public. So good. I'm so, so happy it came out. <laughs> oh God. And, you know, I mean, for me, uh, you know, it's, it's 77 years since Roswell and humanity is still humanity's greatest threat. Uh, you yes. know, no yeah. UFO has ever threatened us with nuclear annihilation. They, they've mm -hmm. warned us about ourselves doing they've it. They've shut our so. nuclear stuff down. They shut times. them down. Yes. Um, so, uh, and, and, you know, a lot of the, you know, I mean, my own, I like many of you, I've, I've had a contact experience. I've had a few and, and uh, I was, uh, I was scared. I did feel the ontological shock. It wasn't what I thought that I was asking for because I was literally, you know, sending the message out there with meditations. You know, I want to meet you. Oh, really? You know, if you want, yeah. you can abduct me yeah. if that's the price of the ticket, you know. And I kind of got what I asked for. Uh, <laughs> and it shocked me and it scared me. But then when I looked at it, and and, and Kathleen Martin was very, very helpful yeah. through through that, you know, my state director is, you know, raised eyebrow and didn't want to hear that his chief investigator at the time and met aliens, right? You know, that was like this rarity that never happens. Uh, but it does happen, you know, like Debs was saying, I think that there's this program to retool humanity into something less warlike and, and that we might become space worthy someday. Um, yes. And uh, I, I don't see any threat coming from them. I, I see threats coming from us. So, uh, and, and I mean, even, you know, like the, the recent, uh, the, the horrible thing that happened to that little village, um, in South America recently, it sounds more like, a, like an op to me, like a military yeah. op where people yeah. were yeah. attacked and, mm -hmm. and, and, and the one little girl that they tried to abduct with grabbing her, you know, uh, she had been speaking, one guy speaking in broken Spanish with an American accent. That's not aliens. I don't no. even know what particular uh, case you're, you're referring to here. Could you Where's just you give it a name? To um, sure. I, I think that it was redacted as a, a YouTube podcast that some, you know, sometimes pretty good, sometimes not so good, but they, they're usually serious people on it. And uh, there, there was an investigation into, uh, uh, it was a an occurrence that happened recently uh, in I can't say it. I'm I'm having Peru. a senior it moment. Peru. Peru. Hmm? It was in Peru. In Peru, thank you, yes. thank you. It was just not coming back. I wanted to say Chile, and yeah. I knew that wasn't it. But uh, you know, I mean, it, it, there were people that had like they attempted to cut their faces off. They used laser like weapons. Uh, it was just kind of a terrorizing of this town. And then it happened to the town next door. And I don't believe it doesn't have any markers from what we have in the archives of, of ET contact. It, right. it sounds very much like an op to me. Yeah. yeah. So I, I don't, I don't believe that they're a threat. I think that if they had wanted to destroy us, uh, look what one little virus did. It shut us down for three years, you know, I mean, if they wanted to get rid of us, you could read the, you know, Stephen King's book, The Stand. I mean, they could have done something like that. Yeah. And, 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 uh, but, but no, here we are, you know, here we are 77 years later, you know, Roswell, Kenneth Arnold sighting. And we are, we've seen the enemy and the enemy is us. That was the old Pogo Walt Kelly yeah. cartoon. And, and I have that cartoon, you know, on my wall over here because I want to remember that. You know, it's, uh, yeah, that's, that's my feelings. On well that. said Preston. What about your thoughts on this? Yeah, well, I agree with Earl. I think the biggest threat is us to each other. And if you take an objective look at what happens when a person is contacted and taken on board, it is overall very positive. It does often start out very fearful, which is certainly mm -hmm. understandable. Travis Walton explained that beautifully, who kind of went 180 degrees, <laughs> started off beginning thinking this was a, difficult and scary experience, but ultimately feels that they saved his life. And I certainly see this with a lot of people. 
And when someone has an onboard experience and they experience a lot of fear and often missing time, probably as partly a result of their fear, they might just end there, not want to pursue it and come away with the feeling this was a negative experience. But what I see is with cases just like Susan's, those who absolutely face it head on, move through these stages of fear and move beyond it and realize, well, you know, this is actually ultimately a positive benevolent experience. Mm-hmm. I have to say the worst I've ever heard, having interviewed hundreds of people who've been taken on board, is being physically examined. And that can be very scary. And occasionally bits of pain do pop up, but often the ETs will even relieve that. Mm-hmm. And people come away from their experience in a, with, in a sense, psychically enhanced, spiritually enlightened to a degree, and pulled out of the box, as we've been talking about, considering a whole new worldview. They're taken down to the engine room, shown how the craft is powered or worked. They're taken up to the control room even put in the pilot seat in yes. many cases <laughs> and show how to fly the craft. How is this negative? They're given messages, often They're about giving you a tour. Power. Like, uh... <laughs> I mean, war, the dangers of nuclear material in any capacity, but the dangers of greed, corruption, war, aggression, mm-hmm. uh, pollution of our planet. Yeah. This yeah. is what they're concerned about. This was the message they gave Susan. Really, it was focused on war and aggression, which is exactly what several other people in the book, in Susan's case, have the same exact message. Mm. So I think if you just take a step back, take an objective look at what actually happens when people have contact, it speaks for itself. You know, this is not an opinion. (laughs) The evidence shows this. No, they're not a threat. They are teachers. They're, They're guiding. I think their agenda is one of teaching, guiding healing warning and waking us up yep I'm glad earl that you mentioned the psychic abilities and the spiritual transformations because that's been overlooked and not given any attention for a long right. time it's such mm-hmm. a big part of this huge so, yeah i don't do, 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 yeah, at all. Based, but based on that preston do you think that they select people with those traits or do people develop those th- traits because they were selected two-way street i mm-hmm. think that there some people are attra- you know attractive to the aliens because they're at that state and they're trying to preserve those genetic lines of people who have already developed those abilities but hands down it will wake you up and i've got case after case where people were basically told this is our gift to you for working yes. with us mm-hmm. those yeah. exact words nice and debs what what are your thoughts on this yeah well i I'm a lifelong contactee experiencer since birth and have always had all of the psi gifts and they keep getting upgraded. Um, You know, they just, they just keep getting upgraded uh, because of the contact. I have daily contact or almost always have contact of some sort and not one of them, not one of those experiences was terrifying or fear inducing, shocking sometimes weird but not yeah. scary but it may be because of where i was in my own personal development when i came in this time i don't know but i i just have to say that with all the thousands of people i've worked with and 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 not just you know uh, on a therapist client relationship with all the research teams i work on all these different research teams and i'm you know i i, I lead these these expeditions and do retreats and teach people how to handle this and how to how to make contacting enjoy it and get something from it it the overarching message is they're us on another level trying to raise us up to a, a higher level where we're not stuck here in this this little place where we've been experimenting with you know negativity and separation and all of that really the main message is the greater cosmos doesn't live that way. This is just a, a specific little niche where we all came to to hang out and have some some uh, experimentation. But as far as the psi gifts, at least they've told me, and I've, I'm pretty aware of it, it, we all have all of that, but most of them are latent or dormant until that timing mechanism goes off. 
and the timing mechanism is set by these experiences. You know, it is a co-creative endeavor. I yes. <laughs> co it's co-creative. And that's really what they're trying to get us to do is to work harmoniously with each other. And yeah. then we can make that leap. I think it was Preston who said, you know, to to then become a spacefaring society, a civilization. We can't do that until we learn to get along with each other and take care of what we have. But it's coming. Uh, look at that. It's just it's just overwhelming all of this stuff that's happening. But as far as is there a is there an agenda, a negative agenda or a fear based or whatever, maybe on some frequencies on some timelines. Because that's what people are wanting to experience and, you know, play around with and everything. But this one that we're talking about right now that we are engaged in. No, I do not believe it. I, I believe this is it, it, it's just us learning how to evolve and yeah. uh, we're getting help from from the higher versions hmm. or from our yes. elder brothers and sisters. I don't know. How about yeah. that? Yeah. Our, our, our galactic brothers and sisters that Things. have caught yeah. on to the game millions of years ago. Richard, yeah. what about yourself, sir? You've been investigating this for a while. Have you formulated any ideas or, you know, uh, theories on, on what these things are and, and if they are good or bad? So as best that I can say, and again, because we're only here right now and there's so much more to experience. So hopefully we evolve and, and uh, our thinking evolves, but uh, I'm sort of on. So, so for whatever it's worth to anybody, I am not an experiencer other than the fact that, you know, seeing things and all that. I'm more of an explorer an investigator of, of life. And so I'm a lot like what I would think Jacques Vallée spoke of. He would be, disappointed he said he would be disappointed if it was just nuts and bolts oh, yeah. and what he, what, he, what, he really, what he really was saying was if if you look at all of our history whatever religion whatever ancient occult religion whatever they've always been here and simply because i'm of the mindset of uh deb's there they are us we are them now what yes. that means is is a, is like holy moly you know, if, if 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 we are them and they are us, this is a whole new ball game. And I think the Precisely. fear that, and here, here's where I'm going in this realm that we live in, and I'm just going to call it that for the lack of better words. You know, two things dictate a lot of what we do: fear and control. Mm -hmm. And I think those are the lessons that we need to learn here. That fear is our inhibitor to creativity to manifestation our own yeah control is another thing where that goes along with fear because you want to control the narrative mm -hmm. the aro thing all these things and it, and i think what they're trying to teach us and and uh, is uh we don't have to be any of that that positive energy is more than the other side so the last part is is and i thought I'm in a chapter where the Dr. Black's, John Mack's book, Abduction, speaks of a guy named Jeff, and he goes through chapters of different uh, people that he's just using as examples. But one of the things is Jeff guy, who was a psychotherapist, I think, too, in his career, he, again, I'm going to go outside the fringes and no box member, he hmm. was an ET. And these people who, beings, were abducting him we're his own people. Exactly. So think about this. And this is what Deb says. It's... They're not here just because they're doing it. They're here because whatever this garden that is here, that we are, this place, whatever that is, I don't know. It's here for a reason to teach and to guide and to do. It. But it's not only us. And if you think about it, people often ask me, you know, how, you know, what are we? And I, and I don't mean this, but I've used it. And when I first heard it, one of the comments says they're just containers. What and people get all kinds of bent out about that. But in actuality, and I think I may have even told this to Susan, I think of us as light bulbs, hmm. burnout. But you see, the energy is us. We may get rid of the light bulb and have to change it. So if you think about maybe our light bulb looks like them one minute, maybe it looks like a, a dinosaur or 
the point is, is that's, in my opinion, the experience of what we're doing. And I didn't necessarily get that from actually interacting with them, I don't think. But I'll be honest with you, and I think maybe Preston said this too, we do interact with them. Yeah. Because we are them, they are us. The manifestation is all of us. Right. And this thing about gift. So, by the way, there is no fear. That, I mean, there is no threat because they're not the threat. We're the we threat. Are. And by the way, yeah. there is no threat. There is yep. no fear. It's an illusion. Yep. And it'll go, again, just my Amen. opinion. Mm -hmm. It'll go away because it's all part of the learning. The point is, is we are them, they are us. Whatever we are. And whatever our abilities and all the aspects of who you are, psychically or sense, whichever sense, we all are that. You just yeah. got to wake up, as I think Preston said and Deb said and even Earl said. You got to wake up to who you are. And if you want to find the answers, in my opinion, just go inside. Yes, yes absolutely. Well all well said. And so read, read, read. reading is, is yeah. a great way to discover things that people can't teach you audibly right meditation so i want to say this when we talked about when i was talking about fear i don't feel like the experience is where the fear came from the fear to me came from afterwards trying to deal with it and what the government would do to me and my family mm -hmm. had i said anything when it happened in 1978, my biggest fear was to have the government come in to my new workplace after, you know, after the experience, when I went back and started working my new workplace, my children's lives, my husband's lives, my life in general, because I can't imagine. Well, I kind of can't imagine because I look at the other people who did report it. And that's exactly where my fear came from even though it hadn't happened yet most you know all those reports and stuff they weren't talked about all those things that were going on i just had the fear of the government finding out and in any way approaching my life because of it because i knew it was something extraordinary something bizarre it seemed almost ridiculous that you could put it in any kind of category because, you know, it's outside the box. But the fear was not from the contact. The fear was from right here on Earth, mm -hmm. the government contact. And yeah. one person that you tell saying something to somebody else that, uh-oh, all of a sudden somebody shows up at your door. That would have been my worst nightmare. And all of that disappeared uh, it, it 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 lessened over the time, but once John's movie, that first 17 seconds about lying, about having to lie about it and the government knowing, just <clears throat> exploded. All, all of it left then. I just knew it was time now, and and I don't have to have that fear. So everybody that I reached out to here, it was like I needed a new tribe because the old tribe wasn't going to work. Right. Going forward with this life, because everybody in my past, the people that had a little part of it, weren't in it. They had, I had never completely shared with because I couldn't. Because if I did, that that's my losing control. That would have been my losing control. Somebody coming in, talking to me, a doctor inter intervening or, you know, trying to talk to anybody about this. It had it not have been, it would have been the perfect time to talk to the OBGYN, the surgeon, the morning after, and just spilled it. But I then I thought, whoa, can you imagine what would happen with that? So I always just knew to hold on to it because there would have to be some kind of time, even if it was on my deathbed, that I'd have to say it. But I'm so glad that that y'all made that movie, Debs. Oh, thank I'm you. So thankful to you, John. I know that he's sitting right here on he the is. screen. I can just feel it. And, and I, every time I do a meditation, it's like he passes me going the opposite way. And we high five and just, mm. keep yeah. it. it's the weirdest thing, mm. but it's so well, precious. It's going to be the domino effect. His movie affected you to come out. Your story is going to affect somebody else to come out. Yeah. This is how it's yep. supposed to be. Uh, Michael. Exactly. 
Yeah, Michael, I know you you come uh, you know with this um, uh, subject because you've been studying it for a few years now, uh, but you're not an experiencer. Like you haven't had an experience anything like that. But what are your thoughts on like the threat narrative based on the information that we know about abductees? Sure. Um, so I'll say, yeah, I'm not an experiencer. Um, I've, I'm not of anything that I would consider a, a UFO or UAP or an extraterrestrial. And I'm also not entirely committed to the extraterrestrial hypothesis itself. I try to let not let my worldview solidify in ways that I can help it. And so I I'm, I'm try to remain as open as possible to lots of different explanations for why people have the experiences they do. I do believe that people have the experiences they report like Susan's. Um, I'm not sure what I think causes that. I kind of leave a, 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 yeah. a, a plethora of, of theoretical options out there, but probably the person I resonate the most with here in the way I think is is Richard, even though I, I probably differ from, from all of us. And, and a bit richard said a few things that that struck me about how um you know fundamentally when we get down to the core maybe there's there's a, a sort of oneness to to everybody we all kind of participate in the same sort of um you know unity of self or something there's a zen teacher i really like who was asked once um how should we treat others and his response was there are no others uh, it's krishnamurti that, oh, okay, yeah krishnamurti yeah <laughs> And that that oh. is kind of something that does sit with me um, in, in a way that other other theories and ideas about the world don't. But as a philosopher, when I think about the question about threat narrative, uh, here are the options that I think are possible. Uh, and most people only consider the first two. And the first option is that if they're extraterrestrials, they're uh, mal malevolent, wholly malevolent, and, and their interests are totally contrary to ours. The other option is that they're wholly benevolent and their interests uh, are, are totally um, aligned with ours. I don't think either of those things is true. People tend to to go towards the second one and say, well, look, based on the evidence, it seems like they're, they're benevolent rather than malevolent. And if those were the only two options, I think the, the evidence probably does point to benevolence rather than malevolence. But the third option is that our interests are mixed, that in some ways our interests are aligned and in some ways they're not because maybe we're if they're extraterrestrial, they might be biologically different from us. They might have different political interests or goals or aims. Um, humans are, ourselves, humanity doesn't have just one core set of, of, of yeah, interests I, that bind us all. We even so say our, that in the movie. Yeah. 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 So our interests yeah. are, are mixed. And so when you ask the question of like, well, is there any threat posed by a possible extraterrestrial group? Threat is just, all a threat is, is the possibility that our interests and theirs might come in conflict with one mm -hmm. another. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I think it's totally possible that if, I think actually it's inevitable that if there's a complex group of people out there and a complex group of people down here, that there are possible scenarios in which their interests and our interests would conflict. And that would, that would mean that they, they do pose a potential threat. Um, so probably there are cases if we take any, any group of, of aliens you want, there are probably cases you could push us into where we would have to become enemies of one another uh, in, for some reason. And maybe that's because we're on the wrong side or they're on the wrong side, or maybe it's just because we're on two different sides, like a spider and an orangutan are on two different sides of like, you know, evolutionary reality or something. Uh, but do I generally think that, that there's evidence that they are, are, are malevolent? No, but if I were running a country, I would say that there's the space of possibilities is probably large enough in which there could be potential conflicts of interest that we need to consider those possibilities really seriously, especially if we don't know a ton about them. You need to sort of err on the side of safety. And, and the government, when they, whenever there is a sort of threat narrative proposed, it's not because they think that's the truth about reality. It's that their job is to speculate about the possibilities of danger sure. obsessively and, and to try to prepare for those. So it sort of skews the public perception the wrong way because right. the public thinks that, oh, the government thinks there's a threat here. And it's like, no, we, the government has paid a bunch of people to, to go and worry about threats okay. and write reports about it. Um, but but what's the truth? Uh, I, I don't know. But I don't think it's impossible that there's a, there's a, a threat um, posed. And I think that if they were smart enough and and advanced enough they could probably be malevolent and and have us all saying the things that we're saying right now 
uh, and and say, well, no, that, you know, we have all of these great you know, move experiences. In. Move in. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. Um, but but is there evidence of that? No, I don't think so. So I'm I'm kind of agnostic on it. What? What about you though? You you pose the question. I want to know your answer, Jason. Yeah. No, well, yeah. I don't. I don't think that they mean us any harm. I think we do get harmed unintentionally. Um, I even think about the Falcon case incident where uh, uh, the gentleman was hurt. He had radiation uh, burns on himself as well. It wasn't intentional. They didn't mean to harm him, but being a close proximity to technology we don't understand, I think is it's very stupid on our part. And I think even what they're doing with the reverse engineering, um, you don't know what you're dealing with. We don't know what we're dealing with. And what I'm more afraid of, is not the maliciousness of the entities, but the maliciousness of our species with the entities technology, that, right? That's yeah. it. And yeah. You, yeah. And you mentioned- It's always been my fear. That's always been the fear. It's that down the because if they want to use that technology against us, they would have. Maybe they have, we no. don't know. But I know for certain, if I could get the upper hand on my enemy by reverse engineering something, and imagine using alien technology against your own species. That's the highest form of treason that yeah. there is, it as really far is. as I'm concerned. The greatest uh, evil. Yeah. So my my whole thinking is I think we are going to cause so much damage with this revelation. I don't think that we're just catching on to what they're up to. We're just catching on that they're here. They've been up at this for a long time. But I don't think it's malicious. I think it's an agenda. I think it's out of our realm of, of understanding because it's alien. It's foreign way of thinking than we can understand. Is it elevated way of thinking or is it just a different pattern of thinking? I don't know. But either way, we're not on equal footing. And the fact that we haven't been attacked yet means absolute maturity and restraint on their part. Because keep in mm -hmm. mind, we're shooting on these buggers all the time. Yep. Uh, last yes, we year don't. we shot three of them down. We shot one down and nothing. All of a sudden the Pentagon comes out. There's nothing to see here. We officially look <laughs> to ourselves. And we're, um, we're back to the Wizard of Oz again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so I think the maliciousness <laughs> of this phenomenon is ourselves. It's not them, but it's what are we going to do? Are we going to hit the nuke buttons the minute they land because mm -hmm. we're terrified and we don't know how to react to this? Um, yeah. You know, it's like toddlers with a loaded shotgun. That's what exactly. we are. And yeah. they're above us. They're they're in it like an adult version of adults. You know what I mean? Like they're above us in some way. So no, I don't think they're they're malicious. And if they were evil, they would have shot Susan right out of the airlock in space. They wouldn't have bothered bringing her back down to no. her destination. They would have said, "Screw this." Uh, we do that with animals when we send droids out and drones out to other planets to go dissect a little frog thing do you think that thing's going to be compassionate towards the frog it's going to be brutal it's going to annihilate that we have cases of that on this planet as well i don't think we're just dealing with one species no not all of them have the best interest for us in heart maybe they're just scientific but they don't care about pain they don't care about causing death they're just going to do it Anyways, that's my but idea. I might also not know enough about us to be compassionate compassion is a, is a skill that requires knowledge too and and like my cat is uh totally discompassionate towards frogs that it catches inside the house but there's no malice in my cat my cat's just no, an right. idiot you know uh and and it's possible that there's like a super technologically advanced society of beings out there that comes down here and just doesn't understand humanity well enough not to like traumatize the hell out of us or like give us all some sort of sickness that it doesn't know while it's trying to, to study us or something so that kind of worries me sometimes too yeah, but keep in mind too, Michael, um, they always say something reassuring. Uh, so it sounds like they've been at it for a long time. They know what to say. They, you know, mm -hmm. why do they block out memories? Why do they give us screen memories? Uh, why do they care? Like uh, even when Whitley Strieber was screaming and yeah. the female how entity we, said, How can yeah. we help you stop screaming? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> that, that's, not, that's a great, great yeah. reaction. Yeah. It's a great yeah, but reaction. The, the very yeah. fact that they asked in his case, would indicate that they don't know something that they might sh should know that might be better right so mm -hmm. um so but it still does worry me I, I wouldn't step well i probably would step onto a, a uap if i were given the chance to be examined or whatever but uh i would be i would be nervous about it but i'd have rules yeah, sure. I'd that's have human rules. human nature yeah. yeah what we don't know what we don't understand or what's different from us 
or from what we understand brings fear. That's we've been programmed to believe that since birth. And yeah. so it's kind of our default survival mechanism, if you will. So there's Fight, nothing flight. wrong with feeling that. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing yeah. wrong with feeling that way. That's a part of walking around in this human spacesuit. It's part of its, you know, protection facility. But yeah, uh, you know, I mean, hire a doctor, but yet we're scared to death for what he's getting ready to do. Oh, but yeah. we pay them and we reach out <laughs> for them. So it really that is that it's is that perception of of how you have to look at that. Yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. you know, we I asked the question once, are we equal to them? But in your case, Susan, when you you were asking where's Karen, where's Karen, which we hear that often, right? Preston, like uh, people <laughs> screaming for their kids, like, where's my kids? Where's my husband or whatever. Yeah. But in this case, they responded, oh, she's behind you having an adventure of her own, not yeah. an abduction. Yeah. It's an and adventure. adventure. Yeah. It's so weird. I knew she was there. I could feel her. I just couldn't see her, but I knew she was there. Yeah. And even and, when and you said gross, and it said not gross, we're the same. Like it, <laughs> it was reading your mind the whole time, and it it was present with you. And that's what I mean. Like if yeah. if it had evil intention, it wouldn't have responded to you. If it thought less of you, it wouldn't have had to answer any wouldn't of your bothered. question. No, it also would not have said yes. You can touch me and let me touch it. Mm-hmm. It that is what was so. It heard me say, "Oh, I really want to touch it." And that's what I was thinking. And that's it, mm. it, it, like, okay. Like, mm. so we were, I was making my own resistance. With, yes. There was none there. Yeah. And, and, but and that it, resistance was myself. Yeah. And it again, with kind of stinky and re, all, <laughs> none of all of that was resistance. Just well, we might smell my, to them too. Who knows, right? Yeah. Maybe they exactly. freeze the place once we leave. <laughs> who knows? That's uh, so awesome. <laughs> Okay, guys, so uh, I know there's a big year ahead. Let's hope that this whole MUFON, alleged MUFON uh, symposium winning, well, it's going to go through. You're definitely going to win this. Yeah, there's no way anybody happen. beats that. Uh, nobody's going to beat happen. this. No. Yeah. Uh, the, the Buffalo abductions. Uh, there's no such thing. Uh, the Jackrabbits <laughs> win. Uh, so, Susan, uh, what, do you have anything planned for this year? Like uh, anything you want to promote or or talk about quickly to the listeners before we sign off? No, um, go to the MUFON Symposium in Dallas in July, yep. 12th and 14th, and find out what's really going on. Because I, sometimes I hear people say things about MUFON, and I think, you have met a different MUFON, because the MUFON I met was simply I contacted them, and they just lit my world up. I have not had one negative word from anybody from MUFON or if there was any negativity, it's, it's from someone who's never had an experience and it's from somebody who just thinks they know who MUFON is because I've just found it to be amazing, uplifting. In any information I could possibly need, I just know there's somebody to call. It, and it's exactly why I, I didn't even know about Earl. I didn't even much know about MUFON when I contacted Preston, but the fact that he was in MUFON and part of it is what gave me um, the sense to call him and reach out to him because not only I could see nothing but kindness, nothing but positivity. There was nothing attached to Preston that was negative or fearful in any way. And it just got better and better and better and better with everyone that I've met. So Love to hear that. Next year, I just expect the same. (laughs) A new story. I've only gotten. How could you expect? I would. I've always had positive experiences, even though they might sometimes look like negative to other people, and they might feel temporarily negative. They've all turned out to be amazing and put me where I am right now, and I'm very comfortable with my experience finally and talking about it. And I don't shake anymore. My mouth doesn't get so dry. (laughs) <laughs> I, you know it happened one way and that's how you tell it exactly how it happened yeah and and the feelings of how it has affected me have become much deeper um i easier I to understand. deal with over time yeah yeah well you know it's i still laugh at how i used to sit in church and when the preacher would be yelling and screaming or saying something i'd go i don't think so so <laughs> 
you know, all that's still with me and I understand it so much more Mm -hmm. because I have just grown so much. I don't even know if there's words for it since I've let this out. And it mostly started after the second I went into hypnosis and then came out, the other end changed. And Mm. Debs did that. It literally shifted my whole thought process. All of my fear, all of my past, every part of it, it all went, any, any part that was dark is golden in some way. Yeah. Well, I didn't do anything. I helped you relax and I held space for you so that you could do it for yourself. And that's how this works. I love how humble you are, Deb. She's so It's healing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, no, it's just, it's, it's the truth. It no, is. It really so is. I think everybody should have hypnosis at some time in their life because it is amazing how you leave the past in the past. Yeah. Once you wake up, you really wake up. Yeah. It is that woke feeling. I don't know what they use it these days, but. It, the woke woke, not woke. but It fixes what's wrong with you. Yeah. It fixes is your deepest hey, I'm Southern California. I'm fine with either. You know. yeah. <laughs> You're woke, woke, woke. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Debs, what about yourself? you have anything coming up this year? Oh, yeah. Uh, the next big thing I have coming up is, uh, is an annual retreat that I, I help host up in Wisconsin, northern Wisconsin, a big uh, remote location, but very nice location with, you know, cabins and stuff. And it started out as that retreat where we helped people to learn how to meditate and go in within and raise their vibrational state as a group, gain heart coherence, and then make contact. So we do a lot of, you know, the field work at night, sky watching, CE5, whatever you want to call it. But it has evolved because we realize that that is, that's what people focus on. You know, I want to contact ETs. I want to see UFOs. And we're all about consciousness the the greater consciousness so we've got a ton of stuff happening at this one uh, i'm so proud and excited about it um if anybody is interested there is a multi-modality thing it's three or four days i can't remember but the week after uh labor day weekend and uh that's a huge thing it's limited because we don't have enough cabins for everybody so if you want to get information, just, just hit me up and I'll, I'll send you to the website that, that will give you the information. Um, and this year, you know, the beings really, uh, and John, after John's passing, uh, he has not shut up. <laughs> He's <laughs> like, okay, you took a couple of days off, but the mission's still happening and you got to get back up in the saddle and get to work. So I, I was given, I needed to start my own podcast I needed to start my own experiencer group for free where people can come and have a tribe and and also where I could help teach some of these self-healing and, and self-discovery methods. Uh, and then uh, I'm, I, I promised to finish at least one of the three books that have been sitting on my desk yeah. for the last several years Do because – do it. I have so much, you know, and I'm like, and everybody's like, how come you don't write books? You've got all this stuff, man. Why don't you do it? So I'm doing it. So I'm a really busy person, but I, this is the work I love to do. And Susan is a prime example of just how powerful we all are. And I think that's what the beings are trying to get yep. through to us. You are unlimited. You are just like us. And we're just trying to shine the flashlight in the dark room so you can see your way out of that box, which is not a box. Yeah. So uh, anyway, that's that's what I'm all about. And people can always just contact me and I'm happy to talk to anyone. So, uh, yeah. And we'll add, and Debs, what we'll do is we'll also add your, your website address to the episode oh, links you. as well. Uh, oh, Preston, you. you are a machine, a writing machine, 32 books in. Uh, what do you have planned for this year and uh, what, what what are you up to? Oh, I plan to actually be a speaker at the Shag Harbor UFO nice. Conference Ooh, later nice. this year, which is a great honor. Cool. I also just want to give a shout out to this book, which Susan's case is in. It's and Humanoids and High Strangeness. For those of you who are uh, listening and not seeing, I think this is, oh, does it say 20 true? I have a hard time yeah. with reading. 20 That's true right. UFO yeah. encounters. Yeah. 
Yeah. And Susan and I talked for a long time. I vetted her case first to make sure it was a legit case. And then we really dived into the details, including not just the encounter itself, but everything surrounding it. Sent her the chapter so she could go through it line by line and make sure everything's yep. perfectly accurate. And she contributed yeah. a lot to the actual chapter itself. I mean, she pretty much, it's its her story. So Susan, I just can't thank you enough. It's such an honor. And I'm so proud of you to be a part of you. this journey with you. You're the one who brought us all together here. Yeah. And you're <laughs> the one who is helping so many people who had experiences like yours. And there's no greater reward, I think, than working with someone like Susan and giving them a platform to help share their experience. So yes. I have to just give you a huge thanks, Susan, for oh, you giving Preston. me a part of that. So yeah, and, and, I mean, at Preston, can we buy this book on Amazon? Is it available there? Where where can we find it? Yeah, yeah, it's on Amazon. Other online retailers. I do have a website, a YouTube channel. I'm all over social media. Pretty Same. easy to find. But yeah, I'm yeah, just very delighted to be a part of this panel here. <laughs> Absolutely, and, we we couldn't do without you. You're you're such an instrumental part. And thing is, you're you're a yes. strong voice in a community, and you know we can tell you're compassionate about it. Like that's what matters the most. And everybody that I met in the community, like everybody's the same. Like they're just good people. I've not met anybody who's like, you know, well, there's one person we all know of that's quite high up there that drank their own Kool-Aid, <laughs> unfortunately, but most people uh, are good in this community, which is great, right? And uh, I appreciate that, Preston. You really have a good heart. Uh, awesome. What about you, Earl? A, Yeah, I, I want to give a quick shout out to John Yost because I'm so glad Susan and you, Debs, mentioned him because I have the sense of his presence too here. That just oh, tickles God. me. <laughs> and it's Thank you, Preston. Time. I just mm. feel like he's right here. Yeah, uh, I, He would his, be so movie, proud. His movie is a small stone that will cause an avalanche. You know what I mean? Uh, it, it's like I said, it's one thing to another. He came out, want to know what happened to him. Susan then contacted him, wanted to know what happened to her. This story is going to come out. It's going to get other people to want to know what's coming out. So this is how we get the movement going. We don't need the government to say shit. No, no. Yeah. We just need to keep <laughs> doing what we're doing. Amen. Right? Yeah. Uh, how about you, Earl? What, what are you up to this year? Um, ripples become waves, you guys, and that's what we're doing. We're, we, we create the ripples that become waves that create uh, changes in society and in personal lives. And that's what could be more important. Um, I just want to say, Susan, I'm so proud of you. And, and, and <laughs> I'm, I'm so happy that we met through, through this spectacular and beautiful, um, mode where you know i didn't know deb's before i knew i knew preston but just you know bump into him at the symposium or something and say hi but uh, you brought us all together and richard was the right field investigator for it oh, yeah. uh, i feel very proud of everybody here and yeah, and yeah. thank you all for doing your job because that's what you were we were all doing and, and we didn't even know we were working together but there we are you know yeah. teamwork yeah. to make the dream work right <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah so mufon.com uh, is a good source uh, if if you if this sounds familiar to anybody out there and in, in the listenership out there uh, there's you, you can click on uh, report and abduction report and entity that that will take you to the experience or resource team you'll speak with somebody like myself or or like Richard um, if you want to get a hold of me personally I'll dox myself uh, Earl Gray Anderson at gmail.com uh, go ahead and <laughs> nice. send me an email I don't mind uh, as far as uh, local stuff that we're doing uh, go to S O C A L MUFON, SoCalMUFON.com. That will take you to our local uh, Southern California MUFON page. And it's it, it'll give you, you know, Richard's full bio, which is very impressive. Uh, and, and you can see what we're doing and come out to a meeting if you're in town or if you're local to us. Uh, other than that, uh, I will be speaking at Contact uh, in the Desert on June 3rd, which I'm very happy about. Uh, I'll be at the symposium and we'll be presenting Susan's uh, Susan's case there. In a I'll, spectacular I'll be there. Fashion. I'll be there. Yeah. I can't wait to meet you in person. Yeah, man, I'll, I'll be in your audience. Yeah, for sure. 
Yeah. That's oh, about um, it. You can Google me, you know, Earl Gray Anderson, and I'll, you yeah. know, I'll, I'll, I'll pop up. Just put Earl Gray Anderson UFO, and, you know, you'll see podcasts and what have you. So, so Earl, you're talking about my case at Contact in the Desert? Uh, no, I'm talking about the oh, symposium. Okay. Oh, I'm not there. I'm at Contact like, in the what? Desert, but I'm not the symposium. Oh, oh okay, yeah. okay. Oh, yes. well, I'll see you at Contact. That's right. That's right. I knew yeah. you were going to be there. But at the symposium, we're, 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 we have the ERT, best of the ERT. We're presenting five different cases, and Richard is Richard and Susan's case is, is the top one. I can't so. wait to, to, to finally meet Kathleen Martin uh, and Seb Talk. I'm so excited about they're that. Sweethearts. They're sweethearts. They're so they're beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Both of yep. them. And yeah. how about you, Richard? Uh, you got anything planned for this year, new investigations you're working on? Well, I, I will say that, please, we need more investigations there. The more that we're able to study, uh, the more that we're able to, to learn, um, and the more that we're able to even be involved in this thing, this passion that we have. And in this case, you know, Susan, and, and she was courageous enough to want to come out and, and find the answers. That she took a lot of, of, you know, courage to make that step and then open it up and 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 we just want people to be courageous there are people out there who do who try to understand and can try to help so that i'm hoping for more investigations and more ert and more just nuts and bolts stuff i'm very fascinated yeah, heck yeah. just yeah. about about those things I, I i will have an opportunity here to go to the integratron um in uh, uh april and may that. to Love go through it. what's called yeah. a, a sound bath Cool. For years. So, for That's those of you who don't know that, that, George Van Tassel uh, uh -huh. helped create the design for the Integratron, which is by Giant Rock, which is uh, over there by uh, 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 Landers and uh, not Landers. Joshua Tree. Joshua, <laughs> Joshua Tree. Actually, uh, it's uh, over there by Pioneer Town. And so, cool. um, and uh, so I'm going to uh, be involved in that. Again, it gets to that whole idea about meditation and energy. And then probably mm. my thing for this year is i just want you it's called the jack rabbit abduction enigma case that's what Yay. we're calling it uh, only because that's a move on thing so uh, <laughs> people can call it whatever they want i'm calling it and 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 earl and i have talked to it's called the jack rabbit uh, abduction enigma case and as you know with any kind of enigma it's a mystery mm -hmm. and you know that's what it's all about for us to just try to learn so that's my hope and, and joy, and, and again, thank you for allowing me to be a part of this uh, this podcast, and, and thank, thank you, you for, for being bringing here. us together. Thank you. Absolutely. And Michael, I was going to say, this is our, uh, we're releasing this March 30th, our fourth year anniversary. Uh, but Michael, I know you've been working a lot behind the scenes with a lot of people at the SCU, but do you, do you have anything you want to share that you'll you'll be doing this year, or <laughs> you want to keep that secret for now? Uh, I have, I have three things that I uh, don't want to share yet. Nice. I, will, I will eventually. <laughs> nice uh, tease though, them. three things. Just a little tease. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, but, but yeah, there, there'll be a publication and there'll be some interesting new conversations in media, but um, but not, not until the time is right. They're a phenomenal writer, so I want to see more writing, you know, Thank as you. much as you can do. I actually... Uh, met Michael because he wrote a, a piece in the debrief about uh, disclosure and philosophy, and I was like, "What? Who is this guy?" And uh, yeah, I've become very good friends with with Michael uh, over the, the I don't know what almost half a year now, it's not a little yeah. bit more than that. Uh, but I talk with him every day, you know, text him or whatever, and uh, it's cool. I've never been in the same room as Michael though; never shared a beer. At, with yeah. any of you I'm, I'm stuck up here up north right so i'm looking forward to getting down to contact in the desert i know a few people now so i won't be too shy uh but seriously guys i appreciate every single one of you today for for joining me on this sunday and this momentous you know uh, uh case that is coming out it's going to become very popular there's going to be a lot of shows reaching out wanting to do recreation i can't wait to see that <laughs> um, and, and Earl, I'll give you, I'll, I'll take pictures of all the artwork that I did. Yeah, Jason's art for this is fantastic. I know. He's, yeah. he's done some beautiful artwork. I've been working with case. Susan. Like, do I get this right? Mm. Well, what's oh, the color? So like, just, Blow yeah. me away. It is so amazing. It is so neat. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I just try to picture myself there as best I can. So right? Yeah. 
but I'll let you use the artwork for sure. Anybody wants to use the artwork, you're free to do so. Um, cool. I, I appreciate this very much. So please keep in touch. Uh, send us the links as this is is going forward. I Each one of you have played a, a crucial role in this, whether or not you feel it was equal to the others. It doesn't matter. You all contributed to this case and to bring this forward to the audience. And soon the world will know the story. Of what took place in 1978. Way to keep that a secret so long, Susan. Uh, but I appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate it so much. I appreciate this this opportunity to talk about this case and just to give you guys all the 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 spotlight for showing people what it takes behind the scenes to to get something like this out and how much work it is for not only the individual stepping forward about their accounts, but having a team behind them that's going to support them and not make them feel like whistleblowers, you know just being threatened and nobody's got their backs. Mm -hmm. That's not the way we work here. So thank you so much. Uh, UAP studies podcast is appreciative of you guys too, as well. The listeners, we wouldn't be here without you guys. And uh, we love you. Michael, do you have anything you want to say before we leave? No, I'm, I'm just grateful that everybody came together for this. And it's, uh, it's such an excellent uh, way to end four years of, or ring in the fifth year, I guess. Yeah. Uh, sure. yeah. Congratulations, you guys. Yeah, I love the you. podcast. That's Thank one of the you. few I, I watch and listen to regularly. So, so amazing. I, I, yeah. I like to say we're yeah. the best UFO podcast or UAP podcast nobody's ever heard of because every time someone's like, I just Whatever. discovered you. Where have you guys been? Like, oh, my gosh. Been around for a bit. <laughs> awesome. Thank you guys so much. And we'll talk soon.